Well, keep your Bibles open to Genesis 1-1. And we are going to be looking at the book of Genesis. We may do it in, in bits and pieces, just to the relief of some of you. Um, you'll, you'll hear more about that. You know, there's a, a, a man who taught a theology at Dallas uh, Theological Seminary years ago, uh, a great mentor to many pastors. His name was Howard Hendricks. Maybe that name rings a bell. He's kind of funny. He always spoke kind of tongue-in-cheek. And one of the things he said, or is reported to have said, is it's not hard to be relevant if you're a pastor. It's not hard to be relevant if you don't care about being biblical. And he, then he said, it's not hard to be biblical if you don't care about being relevant. But if you want to be biblical and relevant, good luck. <laughs> so as we go into this series in Genesis, um, I want to be both biblical and relevant, so good luck, right? We are going to be looking at God's Word this morning, and my concern is not to be a scientist. I'm not. I'm not going to pretend to be one. Um, I'm a pastor who has a very high view of the authority and inspiration of Scripture. And what we have in front of us is an amazing text. We call it the Bible, the Word of God. And I want us as followers of Jesus, when we look at Genesis, the goal isn't to gain more information. The goal is to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Now, there is information there. You're going to see in the text, it's rich. It's very rich. There's lots that we can draw from the text that we'll be looking at in Scripture. But I thought it would be good for us to begin this series just as a reminder about what, what to believe about the Bible. So if in your outline you want to write this down, what to believe about the Bible. Just very quickly, I want to cover some of these basic approaches I take to Scripture. So as you have your Bibles open, I want you to know how I'm approaching the Scripture as a whole. The first is this. Would you write this down? The Bible is true in everything that it affirms. God's Word is true in everything that it affirms. The problem with that is that many times people say it says things it doesn't actually say. They try to make the Bible say things that isn't there. So we got to keep that in mind. The Bible is true. It's authoritative. And by the way, what you have in your hand is really, you have English translations of the Bible that are trustworthy and good. I'm not a Hebrew scholar. Hebrew is not my specialty. That language is not my specialty. But there are people who are much smarter than I am in the Hebrew language who've looked at this for centuries over and over again. And we'll be drawing on some of the best, the best minds over the history of the church on, on how, to, how to interpret this scripture. So that's the first thing. The Bible's true in everything it affirms. Here's the second thing I'd like you to write down. The Bible's meaning comes from the original author, not today's reader. Think about that. The Bible's original meaning comes from the, the original author. The, what it means, the author determines the meaning of it. Not us. Oftentimes, when we read something, it's just human nature. We read something and we impose our ideas, our headlines, our current events onto the Bible and make it say something that's just not in there. It was never the intention of the author. So keep that in mind. Our job, my job, is to understand the Bible the way the original readers understood what was written. Now, God's Word is communicated for us, but it was communicated to someone else back then, and I think that's an important distinction to keep in mind. So would you write this down? Number three, we're going really quickly through this. The Bible was written for us, not to us. So our job is to understand what it meant to the original audience to whom it was written. What did they think? Now, I, I cover those points briefly because... We need to offer ourselves a warning before we approach Genesis chapter 1. We need to remind ourselves that it's important that we not inject or impose our own modern understandings of life on the text that weren't there in the minds of the original audience to whom it was written. The moment we 
impose our ideas and what we think on the text, what we do is we empty God's word of its authority. God's word has authority if you take it for what it meant when it was spoken or written. So because of that, we need to make sure that um, we keep the author's original intention in mind as we go to Genesis chapter 1. Now, I know we have wonderful tools today. We are blessed in this country, and so many of us are literate, that we have great study Bibles and everything, and, and you also have commentaries you can check out. I encourage you to check out as many different sources of other experts as possible on the interpretation of Genesis chapter 1. My job is not to lead a seminary class. I'm also not going to try to correct what your Bible says in the bottom of the footnote. But as you're reading... As you're listening, see, your Bible with, with the study Bibles, there's the scripture on top and the footnotes on the bottom. I want to try with the study Bibles I have to spend more of my time looking at what the Bible says, not once someone says it says. So just to keep that in mind as we go through the scripture. Another thing is I, would, I have to cut off things before they start in this series. And I know that um, some of you might want to, you want to know up front what I, what I think, what my beliefs and thoughts are about young earth creationism. I'm going to use some terms that some of you might go, what is he talking about? And if you know what I'm talking about, great. If you don't, just tune out for just a second. <laughs> young earth creationism. What do I think of young earth creationism? Well, I, I share this with you. Those of you who are young earth creationists, from the biblical text, I understand the word day to be a 24-hour period of time just to set you at ease. I, I'm in agreement with you on that. But I have to tell you this, those of you who are young earth creationists, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with the way many young earth creationists narrowly define words like create and made. It seems that the young earth creationists, in my assessment, are too focused on the science. The, 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 they pride themselves on being literal, but they're really not. They're often just imposing their own ideas of science on the text, and they're making it say something it doesn't say. And I can tell you this, there are people who have turned away from the faith because you're doing things to the text that aren't there. And so just a warning to the young earth creationists, although I'm with you on a 24-hour day. I'm with you there from the text. Now, some of you are old earth creationists. And again, some of you are going, why is he using all these words? Just, just listen, bear with me. Bear with me. Old earth creationists or intelligent design. And I understand, if that's you, I understand your desire to want to engage and integrate science and scientific discoveries into Genesis 1. Um, you don't want people to reject the Bible. I'm with you on that. I don't want people to reject the Bible either. But my question to you as an old earth creationist is this. Is that what the author of Genesis is really trying to say? Did the, did the author of Genesis really write this book to answer questions that modern science poses to it? I don't think so. There's another group out there called the gap theory people. Maybe we have some gap theory folks out there. And again, if this is an interesting, you tune out. I'll tell you when to listen again. Just a second. Just tune out. But there's the gap theory people. And you want to know if I'm a gap theory guy. The gap theory, for those of you who might not be that familiar with it, is where between verses they assume there's billions of years that have been injected in there to make sense of the world that we see around us in scientific discoveries. And again, I say to those who are gap theories people, that's an interesting idea. And I'm asking you to take a new approach to reading the biblical text. We have to read the Bible for what it actually says and not what we want it to say in between the lines. And so I hope that you will be open to learning something new as we go through Genesis. Because the, real, the original audience that Genesis was written to was, was asking the question, they're asking questions like, is this really how God set up the world to operate? At the original audience. Is God the one who set all this up to function this way? They, they were concerned about how they were going to live their real lives in that real world. 
not whether or not there were atoms and quarks and this and that and all these things that we want to put into there. That just isn't there. So the problem I have with whether you're young earth or old earth or gap theory, and if I haven't offended anybody yet, then this is your chance. I'm just going to be equal opportunity in this. My concern with many of those views is that they're all focused on science. Are you for it or against it? I, I, I have a problem with that. But our time in Genesis is going to have a different focus. I want to look at what it meant to the people to whom it was written when it was written. And so here's my understanding. You want to know, bottom line, what does Pastor Scott think? And then after this, some of you are going to tune out and not cut. You'll just watch online, maybe, from this point on. Here's my understanding of Genesis. Whatever happened, whenever it happened, and however it happened, God did it. How's that for something that everybody can nod their heads to? Yeah, I like that. God's the creator. He's the sustainer of all things. Well, let's get started then with who wrote this book. In your outline, if you'd write this down, the human author of Genesis is Moses. Now, I know people are going to say, no, it's not Moses. When I went through seminary, there was a very famous, well-known uh, view that came from German theologians called the JEDP theory. There's the, 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 the Jehovah author. There's the Elohim author. There's the Deuteronomist author. There's the priestly author. Yeah, Moses wrote it, but then all these other people edited and added their own thing. And you know when the Je Jehovah people wrote something because they put the name Jehovah in there. And then the Elohim people put their Elohim name for God in there. And then the Deuteronomist did. I mean, okay, so that's out there. It might be in the bottom of your Bibles, but can you just set that aside for a second? Just, just set it aside for just a second. The human author of Genesis, I think, here, how about this for a way to do it? I think Jesus knew more than I do. That's safe. What did Jesus think about who wrote Genesis? Or the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch? Well, I think this is important. As a follower of Jesus, what did he say? And he wouldn't say something that's not true. He wouldn't say something just to reaffirm Ridiculous superstitions of a primitive uh, civilization. He wouldn't do that. So what did Jesus say? Here's what he said when he was speaking to the guardians of the Jewish faith of his day. It's on the screen. It's from John chapter 5. Jesus said, but do not think I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. If you believed Moses, you would believe me. For he, notice this, wrote about me. But since you do not believe what Moses wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? There's a lot of very important truths in that statement that Jesus made. But one of the ones I want to draw your attention to is Jesus believed Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. And I think that's a good safe, safe ground for me to stand on. So who wrote the book of, of Genesis? Moses. That's my assessment. Now, let me move off of that for just a moment and talk about Moses. Moses is somebody who is remarkably fascinating. To think that God would pick someone like Moses to write it. Moses, Moses had such an amazing upbringing. You know that he was, he's an Israelite. And you know his story too, that he was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. Moses was raised in Pharaoh's court. Moses received the best education of the best civilization of that day. And they had vast records and incredible libraries from other ancient cultures, peoples around them and nations. And they studied other, other nations' laws. The Egyptians knew so much about engineering and architecture. These are very smart, intelligent people. Moses received the best of the best in terms of education. He had all that access. Keep that in mind. When you start reading Genesis... And reading about people groups that have long since disappeared, do you realize Moses probably had access to all that information? Realize that, that when, when Moses gives the Ten Commandments, that he knows there's other nations that have basic rules for how you live in the world of that nation. Why does Moses spend so much time with these minutiae laws? 
because he's been exposed to that in his upbringing, in his education. But most importantly, most importantly, Moses had face-to-face encounters with the God of all creation. And that God revealed to Moses, along with all of his background and education, here's, here's what happened. Here is why you are where you are. Let me explain your past and where you came from. Let me tell you where you're at, and let me tell you where you're going to be heading. So Moses is crucial in understanding and interpreting the book of Genesis, keeping his background in mind. The second thing, another thing I'd like you to write down is this. The original audience of Genesis is the Israelites. It's not the people who are following the Scopes monkey trial. It's the Israelites. They had just come out of Egypt. So keep this in mind. The Israelites had just come out of Egypt. They've been in slavery for over 400 years. And, and, now listen, they have adopted, for the most part, in a completely Egyptian worldview. And the Egyptian religion is very complex. And again, I'm no expert on Egyptian religion, but it's a complex story of the gods having love affairs and reproducing. And Egyptian priests would try to imitate those gods by creating life on earth. That was what the Israelis grew up with. That's what they as a nation were exposed to. Genesis is written to a specific group of people, the Israelites, who are now trying to figure out how they're going to do life away from Egypt. They have been brainwashed, if I guess you'd say, that they have been indoctrinated with a certain view of life. And now they have to figure out where they came from. What's their purpose on earth? Why are they here? Where is this God taking them who just delivered them? These are the things they're thinking about. Again, they're not thinking about Charles Darwin. They're not thinking about Ken Ham. They're not thinking about anybody you and I may be thinking about. They want to know How do we fit into this world that we now have to live in? These are the questions that they're asking. How did they get here? Who is this God? And oftentimes, and I'm sure you've been in this situation, where people ask a question and you give them an answer they weren't even thinking of. As a parent. Hey, Dad, where did I come from? Uh Uh-oh, what's this mean? Birds and bees or where you were born? You came from the hospital. How's that? You see, sometimes we ask questions they're not answering. So if you, if an Israelite is sitting in here and you start going into, well, here's the science on this and here's how science has disproved on this and here's the, they're going to go, what? I'm not asking that question. Have you ever asked somebody what time it is and they tell you how to make a watch? I'm not interested in how to make a watch. The Israelites are not interested in your science. They're just not interested. They're being driven by a much different question. They didn't want to know how to make a watch. They just want to know what time it was. And so we have to interpret Scripture the way the original audience understood it. And we have to be careful not to press details that aren't meant to be pressed. They wanted to have an understanding of where they fit in the world. And they wanted to have a story, a true story, that they could pass on to the next generation. Who could then pass it on to the next generation? Who could then pass it on to the next generation? And that's what we have here. In fact, if you would write this down, if you want to look at an outline and a theme of Genesis, it would be this, blessing the generations. What's the theme of Genesis? Bless the generations. We're not the last generation. There's going to be one after us. There were many generations before us. How are we going to make sense of our world with all these generations that we're aware of? Every generation has a responsibility to know God and who he is and to serve him and to be like him in terms of his character. There's a phrase that's repeated throughout Genesis that is really an interpretive key to to understanding the book. It's a phrase that you're going to see on the screen here. Next slide. It says this, 11 different times it uses the phrase in the NIV, the New International Version, this is the account of, this is the account of, this is the account of, this is the account of. Other other English versions say, this is is the generations of, these are the generations of, these are the generations of. It's It's a Hebrew word that's repeated 11 times, which is a 
notification to all of us that this book is divided into 11 sections. Every time that phrase is used, it's introducing another section. It's telling us that something, is, something new is happening. Something's going to be springing up. It's going to spring up from Adam and his family. It's going to, something new has happened. It's going to spring up from Noah and his family. It's going to spring up from one of Noah's children. And you have 11 of them. And it goes through the whole book with this. This is the outline and the theme. Blessing the generations. And I can't think of a better theme for Maple Ridge than that. Because what we see at our church is different generations here worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. And those of us who are following Jesus and we're in the later stages of our life, we find such joy knowing we can pass on the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to the next generation who will follow him. And so we are a church of generations And we want to see the generations blessed. We want to see graceful handing off of the baton to the next generation. And so Genesis is going to help us see that. Now, by the way, the book of Genesis is full of incredibly bad people. I mean, if I was picking a team, I wouldn't pick this group. And they probably wouldn't pick me. But Genesis is not about the people. They're flawed. Genesis is about the God who called those people into a relationship with him. And that same God is faithful to keep his promises through all the generations. And by the way, just another piece of helpful advice in terms of reading your Bible, you might find it easier to read your Bible if you stop reading it as a book of virtues. It's not a book of virtues. It's not a, here's the moral of the story. The Bible is a book of gospel. Good news that God takes the lives of broken people and makes them new. That's the Bible. So try not to read your Bible with the idea of the old-fashioned Western where, you know, the guys who have the white hats, they're the good guys, and the guys with the black hats are the bad guys. In the Bible, they all have black hats except for one guy named Jesus. He's the only white-hatted guy in the whole book. He's it. It's a book of gospel, not virtues. Now let's look at verse 1. Having said all of that, Chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Stop. That is a statement of introduction. I'm about to tell you a story. That's a statement of introduction. Chapter 1, verse 1 is the beginning of a story. A story that I'm about to tell you so that you can make sense as an Israelite who's been enslaved for 400 years. A story I'm about to tell. I'm about to tell you a story that will help you make sense of your surroundings and how you fit into it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, it's interesting to note in chapter 2, verse 1. Look at verse 1 of chapter 2. There's a repetition of phrase there. You have to see this. It'll help you. In chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. The heavens and the earth. Chapter 2, verse 1. The heavens and the earth. So chapter 1, verse 1, the heavens and the earth. Chapter 2, verse 1, the heavens and the earth. Or if you want to look at it this way. Chapter 1, verse 1, heavens and the earth. Chapter 2, verse 1, heavens and the earth. That's called a bookend. Bookends. I'm about to tell you a story, chapter 1, verse 1, chapter 2, verse 1, I just told you a story. By story, I don't mean something that's not true. So this is what we're looking at here. This is an introductory statement. Nothing, by the way, nothing's been created. Doesn't say he created anything. He's about to tell us about what he's going to, what he's doing in creation. He's about to tell us that. It's an introduction about creation. 
He's saying, God made a world that you fit into. So when we look at chapter 1, verse 1, let's take this away from it. I want you to meet a God. I want you to meet your God. Would you write this down in your outline? Number one, the God into whose story you fit. It's an introductory statement. You're going to fit into this story. Look with me at chapter 1, verse 2. It says, now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. Notice those words, earth, formless, empty, darkness. Where did that come from? It's almost like you go to a play and the curtain goes up and the actors are already there. Nobody comes on stage. It's already there. The actors are all there. So all of a sudden, there's earth. There's formlessness. There's emptiness. There's darkness. In other words, there's no order. There's no purpose. It makes no sense. It's chaotic. There's no function. And, and there's not like something's fighting against something else. It's not like there are these gods who are fighting against this god. And the, no, none of that. None of that at all, which is very different from the Egyptian mindset. So there's no, nothing sinister going on here. It's just there. And God has not yet done his work, but he's about to. He's about to do it. Look at the end of verse 2. It says, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So God's power is circulating over the waters. Would you write this down? He's the God who brings order out of chaos. He's the God who brings order out of chaos. Verse 1 is an introduction. Verse 2 is what God did about it. He brought order out of chaos. Now, we're going to go through verses 3 through 5. But we're going to work backwards. So start with me in verse 5. Look at verse 5. We'll work backwards up to verse 3. And I want you to see something that I, I, I wonder if anybody's noticed this before. I just learned it this past week. And I go, oh, that's really important. Look with me at verse 5 where it says, God called the light day, quote, unquote, day. And the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning, the first day. Why didn't God call the light, light? Why does God call the light, day? And this, by the way, this is where our own background, modern scientific background, gets in the way of us reading the Bible. Right here, at this very point. Because what did it mean to the people to whom it was originally written? You see, they didn't think of light in terms of particle and wave theory. It just didn't exist. Now, that's what we think. Why did, call, why did God call it or name it day? The light he called day. Day. Why? Why did he do that? Well, in the ancient world, when you name something, you created it. The power of branding, creating a name. Naming is something you do when you give it a purpose. You give it a role. You say, this is how you're going to function and what's about to happen here. And so why does call, God call the light day? It's because God created time, a period of time. Now, now keep, let's work backwards. Look at verse 4. We just did verse 5. Go to verse 4. We're going to work backwards here. In verse 4, it says, God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. So again, God takes a period of light, and he separates from a period, a period of darkness. Let's keep working backwards. Look at verse 3. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, we just looked at this. We've got to be consistent. Starting in verse 5, he created a period of light. He called it day. What does he do in verse 4? He creates a period of light. What does he do in verse 3? Again, be consistent. Be consistent. There's a period of light. On day one, God did not create any material objects. They were already there in verse 2. And don't read between the lines. It's, it isn't how did it get there. That's not what this is being written for. Read the verses. 
Don't read your creation scientism into the text. Don't read your evolutionary creationism into the text. Read the text. God brought order out of chaos. So what does God do on day one? He creates a period of time. Would you write that down? Number three, the God who created time on day one. He created time. Now, an Israelite hears this, and they go, okay, I see there's something that God, who called us out of Egypt, is doing. He created something called time that we exist in, that we have to function in. We're trying to understand it. What are some of the big picture things I want us to take from our time in Genesis? Would you write that down and in your outline? The big picture of Genesis 1-1 one, one through chapter 2, verse 3. I want to look at the big picture. If you were to probably ask an Israelite about how important is that, why is, this, why is God important to creation? They, they may. Now, of course, I'm, they're not here. I can't ask them. But from what we see, they, they might say something like this. Well, if God turned himself off, we'd cease to exist. We depend on God for everything. Not just about how it all happened. It, that's not what's important to them. They don't want to know how the clock is made. They want to know what time it is. God is who gives ex meaning to our existence and our purpose. And so for, God to, for there to be no God means there's no laws, there's no order, there's no us. We don't fit in. God is the number one. Only in God do we find our place in this world. So would you write this down? Big picture idea. God alone creates purpose for everything that exists. God alone creates purpose for what exists. And he speaks things into existence. He speaks and he creates. And there's no resistance. There's nothing, there's no other force resisting God when he speaks and he creates. Would you write this down in your outline? God alone brings order out of chaos. God alone brings order out of chaos. Now, for us today, as we begin this series, we have to realize that we might feel in our lives there might be a sense of chaos. Do you know God can bring order out of chaos? That the Spirit of God is hovering right now over the chaos of your life? That God's saying to you, I'm going to tell you a story. I'm about to tell you a story. Here's the story. Here's how you fit in it. Here's how you relate to me. Here's how you love me. Here's how you live in the world you actually live in. This is what we're going to discover as we follow Jesus through the entire book of Genesis, which is called the Gospel according to Genesis, blessing the generations. So you are in for a blessing every Sunday. At the close of the service today, we're going to have prayer partners up here. Maybe, maybe there's something that's chaotic going on in your life and you want prayer for. I would invite you to come and join them at the front of the church at the conclusion of the service. But let's pause for a moment before I close us in prayer and we sing. I'd like us to pause in a moment of reflection about who this God is. Lord God Almighty, you are creator of heaven and earth. You know all things, and we don't. And we want to live for your purposes in this world. We might have chaos going on around us, in us. We ask that you would give us the sense of there's something good that's happening in the midst of the craziness. Jesus, thank you that you came to restore what was lost. And I ask that we would see your grace, that you would make a way in those moments where we feel there's just no way for us to go forward, that you would guide us and that you would give us strength for this day. For we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.